Okay, um, so Iris, go ahead and start. Whatever you are doing, ask yourself, what's the state of my mind? With constant mindfulness and mental alertness, accomplish others' good. This is a practice of bodhisattvas. Maybe we'll um, just have a really gentle start to warm ourselves up for emptiness, go into some of the commentary by His Holiness, and then um, go back over it next week. Um, it's the sort of thing that we need to go through slowly with deep thinking, um, because the concepts aren't brand new. You've, you've done emptiness before. And so here, what we're really looking at is um, absolute bodhicitta. So this concept of absolute bodhicitta or ultimate bodhicitta is the wisdom realizing emptiness that you know in the mind of a bodhisattva. So a direct perceptual realization of emptiness in the mind of a bodhisattva or imbued with uncontrived bodhicitta. That's what we're talking about now. So it's the same emptiness and it's the same bodhicitta that you know and understand a bit, you know, but now you're combining them and that's what ultimate bodhicitta is. So the verses about um, absolute bodhicitta or ultimate bodhicitta are um, 22, 23, and 24, those three verses. So today we'll just do verse 22. Um, and there's a really beautiful commentary by His Holiness in our text um, that maybe you've already read, hopefully you've already read, but um, I'll read some of it to you just because it bears repetition and um, it is quite clear. And Whatever appears is your own mind. Your mind from the start was free from fabrications. Understanding this, do not take to mind inherent signs of subject and object. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. Whatever appears to us is mere mind, both the phenomena of the cyclic realms and those realms beyond the cyclic. This is either a way of saying that external phenomena are a part of the mind, which is related to the Chittamatran school or mind-only school, or the view of the Yogacarya Svatantraka Madhyamika. If I explain it according to the view of the esteemed Chandrakirti, it means that phenomena of both the mundane and non-mundane realms, which appear in their various pure and impure aspects, are all devoid of inherent existence. This view holds that they are established subjectively by the conventional mind and exist merely by virtue of being labeled. If a phenomena truly and concretely exists from its own side as it appears to us, then its true existence should become clearer and clearer when we examine it by its label. Yet in actuality, when we examine it closely, instead of its existence becoming more obvious, we discover that its nature is not to be found. Do we fail to find its nature because the phenomena doesn't, does exist or because it doesn't exist? It is not because of its non-existence that we are unable to find it. It has a function, and therefore it must exist. The wholesome or unwholesome effect that it has upon our environment and upon beings also testifies to its existence. We can see it for ourselves because it exists in our line of vision. So we can deduce that it is not because of its non-existence that we fail to locate its nature. We can be quite sure that it does exist.
but if we go on exploring, looking for its objective existence, do not find it. If it had, an, we would be able to find it, if it had an independent existence. Therefore, we can deduce that it cannot exist objectively, but rather comes into existence naturally through the conventional mind. And then we'll go on to the other verses. So after the absolute bodhicitta section, we get into the verses specific to the six perfections, and then we'll wind up at wisdom, the perfection of wisdom as well. So it pops up a couple of times in this text. Um, before I start the verse, do you have any follow-up thoughts from using prosperity and deprivation, using anger and desire on the path, the verses that we did on Monday, or any remnant stuff about concentration maybe related to your own daily practice, um, just kind of logistics or things you wanted to clarify before we completely shift gears. Did you have any follow-up questions? Or I just want to say that that, that the last time uh, uh, there was a, a material, I mean, few pages and you did a few pages, uh, uh, you did it uh, so quickly. Yeah. And I was, after the class, I was reading, so I couldn't understand many things, but what was, what, maybe there is a reason why you do it this way. So maybe there is, what was, where shall I concentrate in these pages? Oh, on the pages that we did on Monday. I, yeah. I went quickly through them because they were review. So the, the objects of meditation from the Lamrim Chenmo, that exact same identical handout was given to you a few semesters ago and we went through it in depth. And um, I went through it quite quickly as well as some of the other stuff because um, my impression was that everybody's interest was more going towards emptiness and um, ultimate bodhicitta and that's where a lot of people's interest was. So I just didn't give as much space to concentration, but I'm very happy to go back over any specific points or any of the objects of meditation that you were curious about. Um, so please, if there are bits that you want to go back over, I'm happy to go back. I don't have, I don't have, the mo at the moment, I don't have specific uh, things. So if the, in the future, if I need, I will just yeah. let you know. Okay. But, um, you know, the summary, basically, the main, the very main point of the concentration section is on page 28. So you just quickly look at page 28. Just that page really is the main point, and then the rest is detail. So it says, um, <clears throat> supplementary commentaries on transcendent concentration, meaning the perfection of concentration. And then number one, preliminary conditions for shamatha. It says you need to be deeply weary of samsara and feel a strong sense of renunciation. You may be in a re remote retreat place physically, isolated from all distractions, but unless your mind goes into retreat from all its thoughts and feelings too, and stops being constantly agitated by ordinary concerns, you will be no different from an aging yak on a mountainside. Okay. Um, nothing wrong with yaks, but they're not getting the job done. So you must apply the right antidotes for whatever type of disturbing emotion predominates. When strong desire arises, reflect on the unpleasant aspects of the object of your desire. When anger is strong, try to feel more affection and kindness. When mental confusion prevails, reflect on the dependent origination of samsara. When jealousy arises, meditate on the essential quality of yourself and others. When pride arises, mentally exchange places with others. Right, so that's the basic idea. And any, you know, any meditation object that's virtuous is gonna fall under this category if you motivate with bodhicitta. And it's the same concentration that we've talked about the whole time. It's just that the motivation is specifically a bodhicitta motivation. And the way to do that is to remember things like the seven limb prayer that we did in some depth. Yeah. Yeah, so anyway, that's the summary. So if you're getting lost in all the detail, just kind of come back to that page. But if there, if there are any bits kind of bubbling up to the surface that anyone has about concentration, please do um, let me know. Or just in general about your practice, right? Like with weaving things into your daily practice. Um, 
don't be shy. Just because you've been meditating a long time doesn't mean that you should be perfect or that you're not allowed to ask basic questions. It gets harder to ask questions about your daily practice the longer you're in the Dharma because you feel like you should know better already. But actually, you have to be around this stuff a long time before you even have the right questions. You know, you have to have trial and error and, you know, be on a roll for a while and then give up for a while and then be really disciplined and then be totally undisciplined. And, you know, you go through a lot of chapters with your practice before you even know what questions to ask. So, um, so please don't ever feel shy to go back to the beginning, okay? <laughs> Keep the beginner's mind. Yeah. Yeah, Another thing, I was, I, I want to say something concerning the meditation of this morning. I find it, I find it's very, very, I don't know, it, because of the indirect uh, way, it's already difficult, but it's very, very tense, you know, very tense, and I, I'm not acquainted to many, uh, uh, details in inside the meditation and new mantras and so so it was really difficult just i want to mention that yeah it's totally it's it's new to do these kind of tantra style meditations in their um formal form right normally we really you know children sk and i andy maybe as well we totally water it down for you <laughs> right we're just like blue light <laughs> and done, right? Blue light, which is healing energy and compassion. Now here's one mantra, off you go. Yeah, but I mean, you see that tantric meditations are actually very elaborate. This is a very simple tantric meditation, but it's in its complete form. So um, the fact that it's hard is completely normal and to be expected. Um, the fact that you're maybe a little intimidated by it and tense, that's you, <laughs> right? Remember, that's you. The fact that it's new and hard is totally normal, and I'm sure everybody is having that. But if you're having tension in response to newness, I think that's something deeper to explore in general in life, right? If you're expecting new things to come easily, that's an unfair expectation for us to put on ourselves, right? It's not fair. Just because you're smart doesn't mean that new things should come easily, right? It takes time and familiarity. Yeah, so, so be really gentle with yourself and just kind of look for those places where it is familiar, right? Refuge in bodhicitta is familiar, right? Four immeasurable thoughts are familiar. And this is the way we approach these sort of tantric practices is that um, after a fashion, people start to get a commitment to do a practice like this every single day for the rest of their life. And not all of it is clear. And so you're doing this thing that you don't really understand, but you've promised to do it forever. And it's the repetition that helps you build depth and then come to the places where you have clear questions. So it could be that in your daily practice, you're only really connected in a couple key places that are familiar. And the rest, you're just reciting, getting used to the idea. Yeah, just kind of getting used to the structure, getting used to the process. And then you come to realize that um, most of the different tantric practices have a similar layout and a similar formula. They just emphasize slightly different things. The common thing for, um, for Dharma students to do is to try for a while, be annoyed that they don't understand, and give up. That's very common and it's completely natural. But if you give up, you lose the continuity that you've been building by the dailiness of it. And um, so, you know, for you guys, you don't have to do this every day. You don't have a commitment to do this every day. Don't worry about it. Take the pressure off. But do it a couple times because the first time of everything is hard. Remember the first time you meditated on the breath was hard. You know, just the breath, the first time, right? You had like a minute and then you're freaking out like, oh my God, I can't do this. My legs hurt. Or you went into like hazy, sleepy place and thought that that was it and was like, oh, I'm doing so well at meditation right? I mean, just basic breathing meditation was hard in the beginning. So this is just something for you to understand that exists in Tibetan Buddhism. Whether you actually do it or not is totally up to you. It's completely your choice. There's a lot of meditations that might suit people better, but give it enough of a chance to see why it might work 
before you completely give up on it. Because the whole point is that tantric meditation helps you achieve calm abiding, shamatha, and special insight at the same time. So you're using single pointedness and analysis at the same time. So it's a very efficient way to get the job done. But for it to be efficient, it is a little hard, right? So just really, really gently. Yeah, and we can unpack that particular meditation even today if you'd like to. So, um, so please don't feel intimidated just by its newness. Yeah, okay. So let's go ahead and turn to the Manjushri practice. It's at the very end of your text, um, but it says Manjushri practice for developing the seven wisdoms at the top. It says, um, from a meditation on orange Manjushri by the fifth Dalai Lama. So this is, you know, this is straight, unwatered down. This is Kriya Tantra. This is action Tantra practice. Um, it's the part of the practice that is suitable for people without um, an empowerment, without the permission to do the full practice. Um, um, but it is um, a really good example of how tantric sadhanas, tantric um, ritual manuals are laid out. Okay, so they usually start with a homage, like Guru Namo Guruja Vagishari Jha, right? It's, a, it's an homage, basically. You're just saying, um, this has been done before, <laughs> right? I'm not reinventing the wheel. Enlightenment has happened before I met the path. Thank goodness, <laughs> right? That's what a lot of these little praises are. Some of the praises are very long, some of them are very short, but most tantric sadhanas start with a, let's take a moment to remember that this has been done before, that it's um, continually being taught, I'm not alone. Yeah, I'm not alone. And then you do refuge in bodhicitta, and this is the standard refuge in bodhicitta verse. Um, there's variations on the translation, but um, it's the same refuge in bodhicitta verse in pretty much every single practice. And when it says, in my heart, I turn to the three jewels of refuge, you're just really sitting with doctor, medicine, nurses. This is my orientation. Yeah, the real refuge is the medicine or the dharma that I integrate. You know, just that basic refuge that we already know, just kind of sit with, I'm taking refuge in my mind's own ability to change. Yeah, and I'm taking refuge in the fact that that developmental process has happened in others and is being revealed. So you connect with refuge and then, may I free suffering beings and place them in bliss. Right, so not just for myself, but for all sentient beings. May the compassionate spirit of love grow within me that I might complete the enlightening path. Right, so the variations of this prayer are sometimes through the merit of practicing the perfections. May I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. That's the other variation of this same prayer. But even if you only read the heading, Right? So if the words of the prayer aren't resonating for you, just read the heading, Refuge in Bodhicitta, meditate on Refuge in Bodhicitta. Right? And then you see four immeasurable thoughts. You guys know the four immeasurable thoughts. Sit down. All right. Four immeasurable thoughts. Read the prayer or not. Right? Emphasize one more than the other or not. It's completely up to you. The idea is that you do all of it, but you emphasize specific pieces so that you don't get overwhelmed. Yeah, so stop me at any point, okay? So may all sentient beings have happiness in its causes, love. May all sentient beings be free of suffering in its causes, compassion. May all sentient beings not be separated from sorrowless bliss, joy. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free of bias, attachment, and anger, equanimity. So those two are standard, you'll find them everywhere. So you see that the practice is starting out really just straight analytical meditation, using prayers as kind of like a launching pad to awaken your analytical mind. And then as the analysis progresses, it becomes more visual and then becomes more single pointed with analysis. So it's just kind of like steps in a process. Yeah. So then we do an analytical meditation on emptiness because this is particularly a Manjushri meditation. Sometimes the meditation on emptiness is just a very brief remember emptiness and you go, all right, everything's empty. 
and then you go on. Here, it's emphasized to spend a bit more time meditating on emptiness because Manjushri is the Buddha of wisdom, and that's the emphasis of this particular practice. Yeah. So here you could meditate on any of your emptiness meditations. You could think about, I don't know, you could think about the four close placements of mindfulness and arrive at emptiness. You could think about the fourfold analysis. You could think about any of your favorite forms of um, emptiness meditation. Or you could just go through the levels of dependent arising, right? You could think I'm empty because I depend on causes and conditions. I depend upon parts. I depend upon the basis of designation and the mind's imputation on that. Therefore, I can't exist from my own side. Everything similarly. You know, just until something resonates and you have that like, right, got it. So it doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be a whole long process, but it should be enough time that it connects. So instead of one analytical meditation, in Tantra, you're going through a series of analytical meditations step by step, briefly. So, you know, the idea is that you've done all of these meditations on their own at some point in your practice and have a general sense of them, right? Because then you can bring them into this sequential way and you're not overwhelmed because they're all familiar friends to you. You're just doing them quickly. Are you with me so far? Yeah, okay. So um, then the mantra for emptiness is Om Sawala Shuddha Sawadama Sawala Shuddha Hum, which basically means the nature of everything, including myself, is pure because it's empty. Yeah, so you'll see this Om Sawala Shuddha mantra in pretty much all tantric meditations. And it's sometimes that'll be the only key that it's time to meditate on emptiness. Sometimes it won't even say meditate on emptiness. It'll just have that mantra. And that's your little like, right, remember emptiness. So then it goes on, the front generation. It says, within the sphere of emptiness, a lotus and moon seat appear in front of me. So from emptiness, there appears a flat moon disc, right, the seat. And then a load and a lotus underneath it. So you're just visualizing a lotus and a moon seed. That's it, right? Just the first part of the visualization. And you can visualize that because you've seen a picture of a lotus seed and a moon disc. Yeah, you've seen that picture. And you think renunciation, bodhicitta, correct view. Right? So I see this and I think that. Do you see how it's already starting to, to merge single pointedness with analysis? So single pointedly, you're holding this image in your mind's eye. And then analytically in the background, you're remembering its symbolism. But in the beginning, you're just getting used to the idea and you don't have to be that elaborate with it. You're just kind of getting used to the process of building things up. But just so you know, in the back of your mind, that's where it arrives at. Yeah. So upon it sits an orange syllable D. Right? D is the seed syllable of Manjushri, which is basically like the essence of Manjushri-ness. So whatever um, depicts the sound D for you is completely fine to visualize. So it could be the Hebrew characters for D, it could be Sanskrit, it could be Tibetan, it could be English, whatever you like, but a symbol that represents that sound. Yeah, so it's completely fine to use any language you like. It just needs to represent that sound, D. It emits infinite light rays going in all directions. On each light ray are beautiful objects, 
that are offered to all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas throughout space. So, Lotus Mundus D, light, right? Lotus Mundus D, light going out in all directions, offerings to all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, basically making connection to the presence of the enlightened mind. Yeah, so you can think the light itself is the offering or on the tips of the light rays are beautiful offerings like water and flowers and incense and whatever. And then you shift and that same visualization with light going out, that light then starts to dispel the suffering of all sentient beings. So you can imagine specific sentient beings that are distressed. You can think about places on the earth that are distressed or just kind of a general, you know, flooding with light, may all suffering be dispelled. Yeah, so you're already seeing some like aspects of similarity of when we walk you through these practices in their very, very simplified form, you see that we're not just pulling it out of nowhere, it's coming straight from sadhanas like this. We just simplify it to not overwhelm you, right? So when we do Medicine Buddha or when we do Shakyamuni Buddha, you know, these meditations, they're all coming from a sadhana like this, we're just not overwhelming you with the details. Yeah, we're just very gently, <laughs> right? Um, like this. So this whole concept of light going out, dispelling suffering is this tantric idea of ripening through rehearsal, right? Ripening through rehearsal, ripening your Buddha nature or awakening and developing your Buddha nature through rehearsing what it would be like to be a Buddha. Yeah, through, through projecting your identity into the future self, which is fully perfected. So you ripen your Buddha nature by rehearsing your Buddha nature. And that's kind of the fundamental premise of tantric thought. And so by putting yourself in that mental attitude, you bring the possibility closer to the present. Yeah, and there's, um, there's a book by His Holiness called The World of Tibetan Buddhism. And it looks like it's a book for beginners, but it's actually an introduction to all the stages of Tantra. So if you're, you are curious about this and want a more technical presentation, as opposed to the more poetic presentation of Lama Yeshi, um, I would look at that book by the Dalai Lama. It's called The World of Tibetan Buddhism. And it's, it's very clear about the different types of Tantra and the psychology behind them and why they work. It's a really interesting book. So you're ripening through rehearsal, but you're not yet identified with that process. You're thinking of it still in the space in front. Yeah, you're thinking of it still in the existent in the enlightened mind outside of yourself. Gradually, it becomes inside of yourself. But right now, you're just projecting it outward. So you're imagining that light is going out making offerings, light is going out dispelling suffering, but it's not your light yet. Yeah but it's getting you in the right mental atmosphere. So all sentient beings become blissful and become Manjushri, right? So you think, okay, it dispels all the suffering of sentient beings, and now all sentient beings turn into Manjushris. Yeah, tiny Manjushris, giant Manjushris, everybody becomes Manjushri, yeah? The land becomes a pure land. So now you're remembering the possibility and the potential for the great enlightenment. Yeah, when everyone is going to be enlightened. And so, I mean, they're quite profound concepts to go through relatively quickly. You know, each one of these sentences can be its own meditation. The way that we actually wind up practicing if you're a tantric practitioner is that you just read it through and you think of that step by step by step but because you have the commentary in the back of your mind, it has meaning each time, and certain sessions you'll emphasize different parts. So that's why you could do the exact same meditation every day forever and it never get boring. It just gets more and more rich and more and more developed. Yeah, okay. So they're all, they all become Manjushris, and then you think all those Manjushris dissolve into light, dissolve back into the D in the space in front. Yeah, you're like, all right, that's what's going to happen, but it hasn't happened yet. Yeah. Then the D transforms into Manjushri in the space in front. So now you're visualizing one Manjushri in the space in front of you. Orange in color, one face and two arms. Now it says orange in color, one face and two arms because there are many different kinds of Manjushri. So we're talking specifically orange Manjushri in this aspect. 
His right hand is brandishing a sword of wisdom. Yeah, so the sword is cutting through ignorance. Yes. Um, in his left hand, he holds the stem of an Utpala flower, an Utpala lotus, upon its petals in full bloom by his left ear, rests a volume of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra, right, the Heart Sutra. He sits in the Vajra posture, is adorned by precious ornaments. So he has all these necklaces and bracelets and crown and all of these things different to like Medicine Buddha, right? Different to Shakyamuni Buddha. This is um, a, like a supreme form with crowns and jewelry. And you'll see lots of Buddhas with crowns and jewelry. And this is representing different aspects of the able to be of benefit to others. So there's a particular reason for this symbolism. You know, and we can't go into like, the bracelets mean this and the anklets mean this today, but know that it's not just there to be pretty, right? The adornment isn't saying you need to be adorned. The adornment isn't saying riches are important. The adornment is to represent certain aspects of the enlightened mind. So that's why they're depicted. Um, and he's draped in, you know, a flowing mantle and skirt of exquisite cloth, you know, which is supposed to be hovering like an inch from his body and floating and made of transparent light. It's very groovy. Okay, his hair is tied up in five knots, representing the five Buddha families. Um, they coil counterclockwise, which is a, um, one of the marks of a Buddha. Bearing an entrancing and serene smile, he sits amidst a mass of light radiating from his body. So he's um, in smiling aspect, which is showing us that this practice is to help us develop peace, pacification qualities. Sometimes the deities will look um, fierce. Sometimes they'll look desirous, um, depending on what affliction that they're trying to subdue and what quality they're trying to evoke from us. So the fact that sometimes the Buddha is smiling, sometimes he is neutral, sometimes he's fierce, sometimes passionate, None of that is an accident. None of that is art. Yeah, unless you have an art artist who's being too creative and not doing the traditional form. But know that these practices, all this symbolism is really rich with meaning and it's holding all of your previous study and planting it in these different pieces. And then you're holding the whole path to enlightenment represented by an image. And so your mind becomes completely absorbed, both single pointedly and analytically. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be that way in the beginning, right? In the beginning, you could just think wisdom, orange, right? In the beginning, wisdom, orange, just like we do, you know, blue healing, right? White, compassion, you know, we can start very simple, you know, don't overwhelm yourself. But if your mind is relaxed enough and familiar enough that there's boredom, that means you can actually increase the level of detail. So boredom becomes a sign that you're ready to imbue the image with more detail and more meaning so that you keep hitting that sweet spot of really good concentration. Yeah, which is both relaxed and focused. Does it make sense? So if you're holding the image in the space in front and it's not coming clearly, but you feel quite focused, it's a good meditation. If it's not quite focused and you're sort of vaguing out and thinking of other things, that means you can increase the level of detail. Yeah. Okay. So the syllable om marks the crown of his head, odd his throat, whom it is heart, and that represents the enlightened body, speech, and mind. So then we invoke and absorb the wisdom beings. So the whom at Manjushri's heart emits rays of light, invite the wisdom beings from the inconceivable mansion of their own pure lands. They resemble Manjushri described and are surrounded by hosts of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So what's happening here is that you're trying to cut the idea that you're just imagining a Buddha, right? What you're doing is you're building this image, but part of you still thinks you're just imagining it and there are no Buddhas here. So what you do is you take the image you've imagined and then you invite the actual Buddhas into that image. Yeah, so you're saying all the Buddhas in whatever form, Tara, Medicine Buddha, etc., etc., they all take the form of Manjushri because all Buddhas are equal and their capacities are equal. So they're all going to turn into Manjushri and absorb into this image I've created. So now this image I've created is real. 
right? It's not just my imagination. Manjushri is here. So you build it and then you invite to it. Just like when we do Shakyamuni Buddha meditation and I say there's golden light in the space in front, think that it represents all the qualities of kindness and compassion, etc. Right? It's the same idea. It's just more elaborate. So I'm a, I'm a Tantra nerd, but this is my favorite thing, right? This stuff is so rich and it's so beautiful. Um, and I, you know, I hope you can be patient enough to give it a try. But if it's not your cup of tea, that's okay too. There's a million other meditations that are great. I, I find it very interesting, but you're going very fast on the details. So I, I actually would like you to be more slow on the details. Okay. <laughs> like, you, you started saying what represents every color represents something and I started to write it, but then you were so fast I didn't... Well, that. because it doesn't really matter right now at your level, right? The point I'm trying to convey is it's not accidental, it represents something. That's the point I'm trying to convey. All the details you can find in a million different places. You know, like we could spend a whole session just going through the iconography of Manjushri and then we'd have no session left, right? So it's not accidental. You know what I mean? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, if we were sitting down having a cup of tea, we could like make a chart, right? I might even have a chart somewhere knowing me, but um, yeah, <laughs> right. So I am going quickly and I'll go a bit slower. But the reason I'm just marching through it is that um, we don't have time to go into every specific. And also I can't go into all of the specifics because you guys don't have the empowerment. So there's only kind of a surface level of symbolism that we can talk about. Um, yeah. And the reason for the secrecy is because if you hear some of the details without the right context and without the right connection, you'll develop wrong views and you'll develop obstacles. So it's not like you're not allowed because I don't think you're smart enough or you're not allowed because I don't think you're pure enough, nothing like that, okay? It's that without the right context and without the right kind of teacher, the, the danger is greater, you know? And I can't sort of, um, have a one on one with each one of you and make sure that you're not gotten confused in the wrong way or gone onto the wrong track with it. So it's, um, it's the sort of thing that that's why there's the secrecy, right? Is that it's so easy to get wrong views. Yeah, and then you create obstacles. I just want to make sure that I understood something that you said before. Uh, you said that when I imagine the D, you want me to have uh, not just the, the um, not just the echo of, of the D or hearing it, but you want me to visualize a D even in, in Sanskrit or Hebrew or English, it doesn't matter, but it has to have a form. Yeah. You yeah. want it to have a form. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is this thing about Tantra using all of the senses. You know, normally our senses are our enemies and they're distracting us. With Tantra, you're using every, every sense, but in its mental form, to absorb yourself into wisdom. So I could say, meditate on wisdom, and you could have some things to think about. But if I say, visualize this form with this idea while saying this and hearing that, you're completely absorbed, right? You're multitasking meditation. And so it becomes um, a much quicker way to get the job done and kind of more entertaining for yourself as well, right? Um, just, just to say that I'm, I'm fascinated and inspired. Oh, good, <laughs> good. If any point you get overwhelmed, just think, or no, it. No, no. <laughs> it's never too much. It, it, it's interesting, uh, you know, like um, combining or like the method of uh, um, transforming a form, transforming form i mean we start form and then it, we transform the form to something that it, yeah and so it's something that we understand from self psychology and it's like it's good i mean it's uh, stimulating oh that's uh, that's interesting we okay we are having a conversation about that make a note <laughs> we're having a conversation about that um and it is an interesting idea that you imagine something and then you try to cut your idea that it came from your imagination. Yeah, so you imagine something and then you try and remember, actually that what I'm imagining is a real thing that exists and is present. And by thinking that way, I open myself to it, mm -hmm. you know? 
So, so we invoke and absorb the wisdom beings continue. So, right, you've invited all the Buddhas and all the Buddhas take the form of Manjushri and they all dissolve and absorb into the Manjushri in front of you. And then you do this mantra called Zahum Bam Ho. And Zahum Bam Ho is um, a process you're gonna find in every tantric sadhana. Um, so the wisdom beings approach Manjushri, the wisdom beings dissolve into Manjushri, the wisdom beings become inseparable from Manjushri. And um, so they're one, they're inseparable. And you also think that they're happy about it. <laughs> right? That's the extra bit you're supposed to think is that all the Buddhas are very happy to come to the space in front in this form for you. All right, so Zahum Bam Ho. And um, okay, so Manjushri now is absolutely there. And you as an ordinary person, not yet identified as a Buddha, but approaching it, decide to make offerings. Yeah, so you decide to make offerings to Manjushri. And it's the same idea as in the seven limb prayer when we talked about making offerings in the seven limb prayer is about lots of things. It's about overcoming attachment. It's about creating the cause for resources in the future, right? It's about when you offer something beautiful to a representation of what you value, you become more receptive to it. Right, those same ideas exist in Tantra. And then a lot deeper as well, and things to do with your energy system. But in this context, now we're doing specific offerings because the best thing you can offer the Buddha is your practice, right? That's what they want. The Buddhas want you to practice. So each one of these things are physical things you can visualize, but their meaning is a practice element. So water for washing represents purification. So you visualize beautiful water. You can even visualize beautiful bathhouses and baths and showers and marble floors. And some of the descriptions of the bath are um, very elaborate and beautiful. So you visualize this beautiful thing that you might have attachment to, and then you offer it to the Buddhas, but you think that it represents purification. Then you do water for drinking, and you think I'm taking in all the blessings and realizations of the path. Yeah. Then flowers are for the open heart of compassion. Yeah, the Buddhas very much want you to practice compassion. Incense is for ethics, the sweet scent of morality, they say. Then uh, perfume is for a wise mind of faith wise mind of faith. So you can imagine whatever perfume, whatever flowers, whatever that you think are beautiful. Yeah. And then food is for the food of samadhi or the food of concentration. And music is for harmonious communities. So they're all sensory enjoyments that your senses want and crave and hunger for. Um, even if they're not those specific things, the reason these specific things are there are they are the traditional offerings of ancient India that you would give to a king coming to your house or that you would give to a VIP coming to your house, right? They'd come to your house and you'd wash their feet and you'd give them water and you'd give flower garlands over their head and you'd wave um, incense in front of them so it wouldn't be smelly. And then you'd have beautiful lights everywhere and you would offer them perfume and uh, you'd give them food and you'd play beautiful music. So it's the beautiful things you would offer someone important coming to your house in ancient India. And then they represent these particular qualities, which are what the Buddha actually wants us to develop. So you're inviting the Buddhas to your house. You kind of, you know, you want to um, remind yourself that it's important. So there's a lot of teachings about why these offerings and all the layers of meaning with these offerings, but they're not accidental and they're not as simplistic as they look on the surface. Excuse me, may yeah. I ask this? Sure. Can you please repeat the qualities uh, represented by incense, light, and perfume because I didn't catch it? Uh, incense is um, ethics. Ethics. Light is uh, for wisdom, dispelling the darkness of ignorance. Yeah. Perfume is for um, wi uh, a wise faith, a faith based in conviction. Yeah, and then food of samadhi, harmonious communities for food and music. Yeah. Ah, 
So, you know, interesting. So the Garland verse that's in the meditation that I sent you, you know, it's got this whole, you know, way of singing it and there's visualizations that go with it and there's many, many layers of meaning and it can be a little bit intimidating. And then you realize the same process is repeated in every other tantric sadhana with slight variation of the words and you get used to the process and it becomes really beautiful and enriching. But of course, in the beginning, you're just like, what? bloody Sanskrit, what? Okay, you know, and it feels a little bit like, what is going on? You don't have to sing it, you don't have to think it, just think, all right, purification, merit, compassion, ethics, wisdom, faith, samadhi, harmony, you know, and just, you can just think that, right? Just, just like in the beginning, you can look at the headings and connect with those. Um, in this case, you could just look at what's in parentheses and connect with that. So then we make praise. So um, obeisance to your youthful form, like that of a dynamic and graceful 16 year old, blah, blah, blah. Here's where you're getting um, basically what's called clear appearance of the deity. So you've, you're trying to stabilize the vision of the deity and the sense of it being really there, yeah? Made of transparent light, living, you know, able to move three-dimensional. And so you're doing these sort of praises to accumulate merit and to connect with the deity. And then you do the, the actual mantra recitation. So you think then at Manjushri's heart on a moon disc, so the moon disc that was out there and the D is now there um, in Manjushri's heart. And encircling it is the mantra, Omarapatsana D. And the syllables radiate light, gathering the wisdom of explaining, debating, writing, the wisdoms of hearing, thinking, and meditating, possessed by all the Buddha's bodhisattvas, solitary realizers, hearers and wise and learned ones of all Buddhist and non-Buddhist traditions. So you're basically thinking this mantra pulls all the types of wisdom to the space in front of you and gives it to you. Yeah, so you're inviting all the types of wisdom and then you're engaging with all the types of wisdom. <clears throat> and so it goes through then the seven types of wisdom described one by one and each one has their own visualization. So um, I don't know if we should go into those in too much detail, but um, the first is great extensive wisdom so that you have no resistance to understanding the meaning of the Buddhist scriptures, right? So it's not about having no doubt, it's about not having resistance to understanding the meaning. Yeah, so you imagine it's just kind of like clearing the cobwebs, right? So you can actually hear what's being said and then go on to process it well. It's said that this practice is very good for increasing your memory and increasing mental sharpness. We often do the short version before class. That's why children used to lead homage to Manjushri before every class. It's a similar idea to kind of like wake up your wisdom and invite wisdom so that you can learn with a clearer mind. Um, the second one is clear wisdom to understand the subtle and difficult points of the Dharma. Then the third one is quick wisdom which cuts off all ignorance, wrong conception, and doubt. Then the fourth one is profound wisdom, which understands the meaning of the scriptures in a profound, limitless way. And then the wisdom of explaining or teaching, which can perfectly explain the, defi the definite, correct understanding of all the words and meanings of the scriptures. So this doesn't mean that you want to be a teacher or anything. It just means that if you are able co ever communicating Dharma, that you're able to do it in an accurate way that doesn't confuse other people. Because there might be a lot of things about the Dharma that we do understand and that we practice and that we love, but then when we try to explain it conversationally to someone, we wind up confusing them or annoying them, right? So this is to try and bring in that kind of explaining wisdom that can really do it in a precise, accurate way. Then the wisdom of debate, which courageously refutes the damaging words and express wrong ideas and misconceptions. 
And then uh, the wisdom of composition, which uses perfect grammar and words and has meaning of clear wisdom that gives joy to the minds of all sentient beings. So it means, you know, you're wanting the ability to write with wisdom. Yeah, that all forms of communication, may they be imbued with wisdom, including composing. And that whatever you compose is able to stimulate joy in the minds of other people. When they meet the wisdom that you're offering, that they're happy to receive it. So like that, they each have their own visualization. It's in the YouTube video. Um, then the concluding mantra visualization. This is um, kind of a weird, a weird part, but a cool part, um, which is you imagine that a Manjushri takes the form of the little syllable D and the little syllable D then goes on your tongue with its head pointing backward. So there's a little D on your tongue and from the D at, on your tongue, light rays emanate in all directions, transform into offerings. In this case, like the eight auspicious signs, but it could be anything. Um, their blissful, omniscient wisdom and realization um, manifest as orange Ds. So you sending out light, it invites wisdom that all turns into like tons of Ds everywhere. And then they come and absorb into the D on your tongue. Yeah. And then you recite is you 108 Ds in one breath. So D D D D D D D D D D D D D D D D D D right? And at the end of it, um, or as you say each D, a duplicate goes on your tongue and goes down to the little to a little D at your heart. So it's like drop, 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 drop. Yeah, like this. And then at the end of your 108, you swallow and imagine that the D on your tongue comes down absorbs to the D on the moon disk at your heart, which becomes very brilliant. A measurable orange light rays radiate from the D, filling your whole body, purifying all negative karma, sickness, and hindrances. And you think, I have received the special qualities of memory, which does not forget the words and meanings of the teachings and of knowledge of all things past, present, and future. So His Holiness says, it's important to plant that thought because it creates the cause for that to actually awaken. So to think, I have received the special qualities of memory. Now, it all seems rather far out and, you know, like what? But, you know, it, it is interesting to me that I know so many old Geshis and I don't know any with Alzheimer's. I don't know any with dementia. I'm sure it happens, but, you know, I mean, my teacher's 84 and he is sharp as anything, you know? so. It, it, look, it can't hurt, right? <laughs> it can't hurt. Okay, any questions so far? Yeah. I would like to say something concerning the development, the process of development in psychoanalysis from concepts like uh, incorporation, which can be uh, discerned in these uh, processes of uh, rituals and the uh, practices of the mind, of uh, training the mind. From this, uh, for example, the totem and taboo of Freudian uh, thinking, of incorporating uh, the, the big idea or the big uh, embedded idea within the father figure into what cohesion legacy is uh, lying before us with the notion of merging. Merging is totally different from incorporating. And I think what is very interesting in this is that you are not internalizing contents, mental contents, but you become a total and absolute mentality. You become an absolute uh, totality of the, of the ultimate. That's something which is so interesting in the developmental line of psychoanalysis during 120 years. It's mm -hmm. quite amazing. Yeah, and, and all the reasons why that works, you know, that's all, you know, I'm sure there's interesting neuroscientists and interesting meditative things and interesting logical things. But, but what's, what's interesting to me is that there's been a lot of tantric practices where I just read it and just do what it says without completely understanding everything. And still there's an effect, 
you know, there's of course more effect the more you learn about it, but it is a bit like, yeah, it's not so much about the content, it's about the becoming. And so in one sense, there's a lot of thought behind every one of these pieces. And on another sense, you're not thinking too hard. You know, it's sort of, it's a little bit paradoxical, but um, it is interesting to just like read it, do what it says, see what happens without expectations. It's interesting. Um, and then we have these sort of psychological traps we fall into where we think, okay, I've just done this whole meditation, but I didn't do it right. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know anything about this. I'm just an ordinary person. What is the deal? And you have normal doubts arise. And so then you have to purify any mental projections about having made mistakes, you do the Vajrasattva mantra. And this is common in every sadhana as well, is that once you've done the main part of the practice, then you do a very short purification to get rid of any like superstitions, any misconceptions, any self-doubt that you didn't do it perfectly, right? And so you just imagine Vajrasattva, crown of your head, do three mantras, done. Yeah, and of course, the hundred syllable mantra of Vajrasattva is of course very intimidating the first time you see it, but it becomes the sort of thing where it's like, you know, mother's milk and it comes second nature the more you do it. Um, and it's a very powerful mantra. So if you don't like the mantra or the mantra is too hard, you can just think Om Vajrasattva Hum, <laughs> right? That's the short one, right? Rather than Om Vajrasattva Samaya Manapalaya, that one. Um, or you can just think white light, flushing the system, clearing any obstacles. If the whole concept of adding the mantra is too overwhelming, you just think white light floods the system, any mistakes, omissions, whatever, gone. And you can repeat the offerings and the praise just if you want more merit, if you've got more time. You can add a Lam Rim meditation here um, using one of the prayers that you like, like for example, the three principal aspects of the path that we did our retreat on a year or so ago, or foundation of all good qualities, some sort of like abbreviated scan through a Lam Rim process. It's optional, but that's a good place for it. And then at the end, you think Manjushri in the space in front comes to the top of your head, dissolves into you, Manjushri's mind and my mind become non-dual. My body becomes clean and clear like crystal. My mind is like Manjushri's, saturated by compassion and wisdom. And you just sit with that. And then once, you're, once you start getting distracted or it feels like time to shift, Manjushri reappears at the crown to help you engage in extensive deeds to benefit all sentient beings. Um, if you have the empowerment, you arise as Manjushri, and then you think you're walking around as Manjushri in your day, and you're listening for wisdom mantra and the sounds you hear, you're looking for enlightened aspects in the beings you see, and you imagine everything's a pure land. But that, of course, requires a great deal of conversation and thought, how that actually works, and you don't want to do it before you have an empowerment. It's a bad idea. So for those without the empowerment, you just think Manjushri is together with me all the time, crown of the head. Yeah. And then, you know, more, more as you get into the practice or not. And then you dedicate, because we dedicate, right? All the energy you put into this practice may go to enlightenment. And um, the specific dedication is, may we quickly attain the attainments of Manjushri. Um, often you add long life prayers for your teachers at the end of practices like this, but it's optional. And that is um, the Manjushri meditation in a nutshell. So um, try it again before you give up on it, but if it's not your cup of tea, don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. Just so you know that it exists. Yeah, and that this is the more um, fully fledged tantric way of meditating, uh, meditating as opposed to the really simplified version that we normally do. All right, so just take a minute and reconnect. Okay, thanks guys.